for loads of county finals to get through this weekend again lads and some provincial club championship matches which I don't think should cross over with county finals at all but I'll give out about that now in a little while um, the first big match of the weekend well the big match probably of the weekend you'd say is Kilmaco Crokes and St. Jude's on TG Cahar it's the second game at 3.15 like I mean this is a repeat of the 2018 um, final um, due or Kilmaco Crokes going for the double um, Lee St. Jude's are interesting in that nine of their players aren't from St. Jude's at all. They're Kulchis. Um, against the big, huge, you know, the big juggernaut of Kilmaco Crokes with a, with a pick that you'd probably pick about five different teams for. So, I don't know. I'm rooting for the I'm rooting for the Kulchis, even though I'm against having nine bloody transfers on your team. So, I, I don't know. There's, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, definitely. Um, with St. Jude's, they've got so many players from all over. Kerry man, Cork man. One man, Mark Sweeney from Antrim, uh, Kildare man, everything, you know, they, they've they got the whole range, to be fair to them. But um, no, yeah, you got to root for them, you know, they haven't won it. Uh, they lost out in 2018. I was uh, listening to like a, an interview with the captain and he was talking about how well, they really struggled to get scores in previous years and how he said, like, they were really mean defence, really compact and hard to break down. But going forward, they just weren't racking up the sort of scores that a championship uh, winning team would rack up but you know now they've got players like David Mannix you know from yeah. Gary who's, but here, who's but really here, helping out with that here's here's the thing Lee so they're struggling for scores and most clubs have to go Jesus there's an under 12 yeah. now we'll have to wait for him to come up they just get David Mannix from Kerry and now they're in a county final yeah. with a scoring forward like do you know what I mean it's yeah. it's, it's strange like I, that, well, that's exactly the point I was going to make. You know, they didn't have to wait or nurture some young lad trying to come through and try not to rush him and, you know, yeah. give him all the time in the world. They got this guy who's effectively the end product. You know, it's, he's, he's already like a, a senior footballer and he's all, he's ready-made, as it were. Um, I'm trying to think of disadvantages of this, really, but I suppose maybe maybe longevity, because, like, if they're coming to this club, you know, because they've got jobs in, in the capital or whatever, uh, they maybe won't be there in the next three or four years. So you get a great player out of the blue, but you could lose them out of the blue. But, I mean, they're not complaining now. No, they're definitely not. Obviously, Kevin McManaman is their big homegrown player. But I, I spoke with Niall Coakley. He's their free taker um, a forward as well. Brian Coakley, Alex Hassett, you've mentioned, or Jack Maguire, Pat Spillanson. Pat Spillanson is an interesting one in that not massively rated in Temple, no. Um, apparently, he's got himself really, really fit and moved to Dublin. And now he's a big player for them. Like, I mean, I don't, the information I have is that it wasn't a complete disaster in Temple, no, that, you know, that he was, he was gone because, you know, he wouldn't have been massively highly rated. And I think he's lost a bit of weight and got really fit. Maybe the football was there. You know, I'm trying to read into it here now. Isn't it mad that Fats Spillane's son, like, didn't make the Temple, no team, like when they were, I think they won the All-Ireland Junior Club, was it 2014? Was he young for that though? He must have been... Maybe he was, like that was yeah. a while ago now, but like if you're saying he wasn't a big loss, you'd think nearly just being Pat Spillane's son, you'd walk onto the team, like, but uh, no, he's he's he played well the last, he was man of the match, and apparently I was chatting to Tom LaHiff, he's the Jude's captain, he's just saying he's fit as a fiddle, like, and he's flying all over the place, so I suppose that would remind you a bit of his owl lad, wouldn't it? Like, Yeah, well he didn't lick, he didn't lick flying flying fit up off the ground anyways. Paul Mannion, obviously the big one for Kilmacook Crokes. We talked about him before. He's playing pretty much centre forward. Shane Cunningham has been has been interviewed uh, during the week. He was doing the media. Lee, you were talking to him. But he's talking about Paul Mannion and poor old Shane Cunningham. Everybody wants to talk about Paul Mannion because he didn't <laughs> play with Dublin. And like, I mean, th- you know, the rest of it's just a side story. You know, is he going back, whatever. Um, you know, but he was saying that at club level, he's playing pretty much at centre forward an awful lot of the time. He said his passing is very underrated, which is nice to hear. And like, he's an ex-soccer player. So like, I'm sure he has got that kind of, uh, you know, he has that vision in his game. You can see that. But he's been double marked a lot inside. You know, you play, mm-hmm. you play Kilmico Crokes, the star show, the star of the show. If you play a sweeper, he's not covering the three players, he's covering Mannion. So he's been double marked. So they put him out centre forward, give him that little bit of freedom. A little bit like John McGrath, probably Lockmore, Castellini, uh, Niall. But you know, like, I mean, it, it's a pretty obvious thing. But like, I mean, a lot of teams just leave their 13 and 13 and go, look, just get into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, David Clifford does something similar for his club. He'd play on the half-forward lane rather than on the inside. It just makes sense, I think, when you're corner-forward. Like, by the nature of the position, you know, you're close to the end line. Um, if you play a sweeper, you're then you're sort of being double-teamed on. And, you, like, with, with Paul Mannion and the kind of form he's in, and if it's in club football, you're never going to keep him quiet, per se. But you can minimise, you know, his threat as best you can. Try to force him down blind, blind alleys and stuff. So it, ju- it just makes sense, you know, uh, from their point of view to play him at centre-half forward where 
he's a lot more options to make. You know, he can run in from deep. He can get the head up, and pick passes, use his vision, as you were saying. And and like you give a team or a player of his caliber, when you give him options, you know, more often than not, he's going to take the right option, and you're going to get the best out of him. Then you know, um, I was talking to Shane Cunningham, and like to be fair, it was it was one of the first questions I asked him. It was like you must be buzzing just to have him, you know, like for the full year. And you know, he didn't he didn't hate about it. You know, he says like we're delighted to have him around full time um, and not losing to Dublin at all. Obviously, they'd support him and stuff. You know, if he did go back to the Dublin team, but um, the you know there was no secret. Like it's just brilliant to have him and. Of course it is yeah and Rory O'Carroll too um he was mentioning him as well here's the thing before we move off this um game I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to it like so they've nine outside transfer St. Jude's now this will sound rich coming from me now because I played with parallels and we had more than nine by the time I was probably leaving the first year not that many and it started building up and then I left and it like it turned a bit of a it turned a bit farcical like I mean right. just different inter-county players landing the whole time and there is a challenge integrating them with the lads from there and how what's the relationship like and you know are the, the lads from the club happy to be dropped for these new fellas and do these new fellas love the club or why are they there all these t- there's a it was turned into a bit of a bit of a toxic environment in Parnells but obviously there's a much better dynamic in St. Jude's and they seem to have a much better club mm. a, club kind of uh, camaraderie and atmosphere but here's the thing so St. Jude's would be playing against Chemical Crokes and I'd be rooting for Jude's they've never won it even though they've denied transfers only probably because Chemical Crokes are such a bloody juggernaut they've something like 10,000 members and you know like I mean they're well able for it and Jude's have had a few tra- or Kilma could have had a few transfers down, lo- down, the, down the years um, Kavanagh from Long- Brian Kavanagh from Longford and a, and a few there now I think as well isn't there wing forward Shane Horn I think is yeah well, he's from Dublin Offaly. he's outside for Offaly he plays for Offaly okay. but he transferred to them I think he's from uh, he's from there but the, here's the thing if they win that out they'll probably play, end up playing Port Arlington if Port Arlington can beat the Westmead champions and Port Arlington have no outside transfers they don't have this so my argument used to be in Dublin club football they all have transfers it's fair but how is it fair when they come outside of Dublin to be playing clubs that are just depending on their own little town or village do you know mm. I, my, my argument on it was is because in 2007 we lost the Leinster semi-final to St Vincent's and they had three outside transfers. One of them was corner forward who scored 2-2. The other one was midfield and O'Shea from Kerry who fetched every ball in the sky. Who I think he was man of the match. And the other lad, a Kelly from Mayo who, who marked <coughs> me, right? Two of those three left the club the following year. They won the All-Ireland Club that year. So, like, I mean, should they have been allowed play? I don't know. Like, I mean, there, it's just, it, maybe if there's a commitment to the club for two or three years you might say that's fair enough. Then they should be allowed playing the, in the provincial club championships outside of the Dublin club championships, which have all, you know, are, every team has transfers and it doesn't seem as unfair there. But my, my take on it is that when they come out of Dublin, how is it fair that all these transfers who might only be at the club for a year, you know, could potentially go all the way? Yeah, I suppose that is the thing that it's fair enough when they're in Dublin and it, like there's most clubs have transfers coming up, like lads working, lads in college and they just set up with that club but like and in fairness that is like a, coming from up down the country that is fairly alien to me like because when you <coughs> you think of club GA you th- you're thinking about the players you've played with the whole way up along you've won with them you've lost with them and you know you might be stuck to fill a team the odd days and these are the lads that come with you and it's just it's a strange sort of dynamic but I suppose if that is the way that it is in Dublin that's fair enough. Yeah, but. and it is fair enough because you're not criticising them. These mm. Dublin clubs are giving these lads who've moved to Dublin a team to play with. So there's nothing wrong with what they're doing. Yeah. It just seems like an unfair advantage to me. Yeah, like the thing you say about David Mannix coming in from Kerry and just like immediately giving St. Jude's, like it's like a transfer in soccer coming in. Yeah. And he's like doing exactly what they needed. Like, and you know, he's not a player that came up through the underage in St. Jude's and who did this and who St. Jude's have been waiting for. Like, and it kind of seems like it's it's a real sort of a quick fix and then when they're going down to play someone like Port Arlington like they can't they don't have players coming in like that and like it is a little bit unfair and you you would as as you said probably something like uh, they'd have to be there for three years or something like that I don't know it's hard to it's well, hard to a, get there, your head around there's, there's obviously the, the rule in rugby where you have to be at Munster or Leinster for three years before you can play for Ireland you know it's something yeah. like that to show the commitment there it's not like someone can just come in and play with Leinster and suddenly they're on the Ireland team I don't know something like that um, might be a little bit fair we have to move on um, from that one because Bell Mullet this is the other game on TG Catter at half past one Bell Mullet are playing Knockmore 
um, in Ballina. Bell Mullet are in the county final for the first time since 1981. They've never won it. They were playing intermediate um, in 2018. So to explain to us how they've done it, it's our Mayo correspondent, Connor Heenahan, is on the line um, now. How's it going, Connor? Yeah, all good, Willie. How are you? All good. All good. So I said intermediate level in 2018. I didn't even add in that Chris Barrett, their legendary Chris Barrett, retired in that time as well. So like a, another body blow for Belmont, and they're still here. <clears throat> yeah, you're bringing back bad memories for me there, Willie. It was um, 2018. Belmullet beat Keltamaa in the group stages and then again in the semi-final, very narrowly in the semi-final. Right. And then they went, to, they went on to win the, the final, actually handy enough that year, and they've been seniors since. So they lost, um, yeah, they lost, they lost Chris, I, I think, the next year. But it's just, that's, that, that's the thing with Belmullet Woolley, is that um, Belmullet have been intermediate, like were intermediate for most of the time in my time. But a lot of that to do is, is, is to do with their location and the fact that it's, you know, it's very very badly affected by emigration and even people that maybe move to the bigger cities. Belmullet is a long way to go if you're going to, you know, try and commit to playing senior football and stuff. So it's never been a question of talent, really. It's just been a matter of resources. And I think COVID has probably helped, you know, a lot of their lads probably stay at home. So, right. you know, it's just, it's, it's allowed that collection of footballers to stay together for longer and they're, they're reaping the benefits for sure. I saw an interview with Colin Barrett. Um, I don't think he's related uh, to Chris. He said, it's a huge commitment from everyone. There's only four or five of us based in Bell Mullet. And you talk about emigration. You're practically in New York at that stage, Bell Mullet or so far west. Yeah, it's, it's next stop New York. It's next, next, next stop New York, really. It's a lovely part of the world, Willie, but I think they train around that loan or, or somewhere in the Midlands. But uh, like I was even thinking about it is that like a lot of clubs would use the center of excellence in, in Bacon, which is which is right on the border of Roscommon. Uh, that's where a lot of the club games have been uh, at the quarterfinals were there as well. But Belmullet is that far west that people coming from Dublin, that would nearly be halfway, be a little closer to Belmullet, but it's not far off. Right. You'd be talking like an hour and a half, an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes to get there from Bel- from, from Belmullet. So like, you know, I know a lot of clubs have to do that, have to train, you know, have to meet up the country to train, but it is that bit of an extra um, commitment for Belmont. They are that far, they are that far away, you know. So, like, I mean, you're playing against them in 2018, you know, they're they're beating ye. Is this the same group of players or have that they had an injection? They, 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 there is a lot of those players still there. There's, they, 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 have a lot of, they have a lot of players that would have played kind of um, underage for Mayo at various stages, you know. Um, under 21 minor and stuff like that maybe not quite had uh, maybe not quite made the breakthrough senior but I know that there's a current group of young players playing for Belmont that would have you know repeatedly contested underage finals at A level right um, you know they, they'd probably be early 20s around 21 to 24 now so you're kind of merging that that group um, with the lads that, that would have played against us I don't think they've lost too many like obviously they've lost Chris Barrett but They've a couple of they've a couple of lads that are that are my age and beyond, so late thirties fully. That like Shane Allen, the keeper, would be one. I think Eamon McAndrew comes off the bench. Henry gone, um, ar- around that age. So they've kind of merged it with you know the 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 lads that have been established for a few years with the with lads that are used to competing at the top level at underage against the likes of Knock Moore, who were also very strong underage around the same age as, as, as the lads that make up the bulk of the, the Belmola team. So it's not, they're, they're no strangers to, you know, they're, they're not senior championship for that long, but they're no strangers to competing at the top level for the age groups that they've been in. Right, because I think Colin Bard was saying, it was an interview in one of the newspapers out there, that they wouldn't have been very fearful of Westport because they would have played against them a lot, you know, underage. So they're obviously obviously pretty strong. They must be a pretty defensive team. Like, I mean, they, they beat Knockmore. This is their path. They've beaten Knockmore, they've beaten Briefy, and they've beaten Westport to get to the final. Like, talking about three, arguably the three best teams um, in, in Mayo, like three of the best teams in Mayo, they've kept Knockmore to 1-4, they kept Briefy to eight points and they kept Westport to nine points. Like, I mean, are we looking at a very defensive team here, a young, tenacious team that likes to tackle hard? Yeah, well, we know that kind of system. Is that is that what we're expecting on TG Cahar on Sunday? Yeah, like you will see a bit of that, Willie. Uh, you will see a bit of that. And they, what they have in their favour as well is that the, the game is on in Ballina. Mikhail Park is obviously out of action at the moment. So the game is on in Ballina and this will be Belmullet's fourth game, I think, in Ballina, including the beach. Westport in Balna, they beat Brafey in Balna. Now they beat not more in the championship down in Belmullet. And I don't like anyone who's played there doesn't need reminding that Belmullet is a very tough place to go. It's like <laughs> right on the 
<laughs> right on the Atlantic. It's it's a game of two halves. You could have the, the calmest <laughs> weather throughout the country. It'd be the it'll be the game of two halves because the wind is so strong about Mullet. So I, I would take that into account. But they are they do play defensively in terms of I I, I got to see them up close against um against Westport in the semi final where they tried to create a lot of space for Ryan O'Donoghue inside. Now Ryan will inevitably come come out the field and get involved at various stages as well. But it's not that they're I, like, I don't want to call them too dour defensive, Woolly, because not only that, but they do have a structure and they, you know, they do have a sound defensive structure and that, that's kind of illustrated in the scores that they've conceded to date. But they love defending. <sighs> and and the best thing I could say, the best thing I could say about Bell Mullet is that they, in the nicest way possible, they have absolutely bags of attitude. Do you know, they, they, will, they will be in Knockmore's faces. They were in breaking <laughs> spaces. They were in Westport's faces. They do not make it easy. You know, if they win a tackle, if they win a turnover, you know, not more are going to know about it, you know, kind of Munster hurling style, um, you know, celebrating freeze and stuff like that. But like, and they'll bring, they're going to bring a raucous, massive crowd uh, down from Ben Muller with them as well. So it will, it will be defensive at, at stages and it will be quite tactical at stages if it, if it proceeds along the same lines as their games against um, uh, Westport and Brafie, which I think will be low scoring. But the, the game against Westport was very low scoring, but was very, very entertaining at the same time. So I, 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 I don't expect a shootout, but I won't. I don't expect people to be reaching for their remotes and turning over the channel either. Right. So they're, they have to bring the whole of Belmullet. There's only a thousand people there. They won't even fill the stand with, with everybody. But they'd be <laughs> raucous, as you say. So there'd be mad, yes. mad kind of uh, men in Belmullet. I, and now that you mentioned they love defending, what was that great quote on Adonah who said, um, before about likes to make uh, corner forwards life a misery or a, a torture, something was, on those lines. That was exactly what he said, and he's he's got out the field, Willie. So he, he's he playing centre back center now. Back. He's playing centre back now. So the three lads inside him love defending even more than Willie. <laughs> <Donald. That's laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing that. Patter Gardner needs a shout out. He's in with them as coach. Like, I mean, you know, obviously Patter Gardner wouldn't have much experience with defensive systems. I'm a little bit surprised, but they, they speak very highly of him and the whole management team. They have a pretty big backroom team. Yeah. So Patter Patter Gardner's in with the uh, with the under 20s. So he's in with Myra Sheridan this year as well with Mayo. Um, and part of it's interesting. So the manager is Damien Mulligan. So both Pather and Damien Mulligan are from Cross and Lina. And from that great Cross and Lina team of the, you know, late 90s, yeah. early 2000s that would have won in All Ireland, got to All Ireland finals and stuff. And loads of that team, Damien Mulligan, you know, Kieran McDonald's obviously in the Mayo setup. Michael Miles is the Mayo ladies manager. Uh, Damien Mulligan's involved with, uh, with, with, with Bad Mullet and Pather obviously as well. So there's obviously, you know, they're, they're putting their keen kind of football reins to use. But um, Jamie Mulligan's been there a few years, kind of introduced Pather this year, I think. And and, and like you, Willie, I've, I've, I've only heard good things about kind of what he's brought to the setup. Pather, obviously, very well known as a flying wing back. You might, you you will see that a, a bit, bit of that from from Ben, ben Mullet as well in terms of when they get the when they turn the ball over, they turn to move very quickly. But um, but yeah, by all accounts, um, Jamie and Mulligan, Jamie Mulligan and Pather Garner have done very well, and everybody in the setup, you know, it's, it's a kind of a young impressionable group. And they've really bought into it. So, um, and it speaks volumes. You could just tell from from the way they play that they're very united, and and you know the, the crowd will buy into that as well. And I think they they'll they'll have a huge impact on Sunday too. Right. Okay. So Ryan O'Donoghue, who's their county man, obviously in the forwards, like we're talking about, Owen O'Donoghue, then at centre back, here the big county man, and he loves to defend. Like a few weeks before the club championship started, Connor. Bell Mullet needed a league win to avoid going down to Division Three. So maybe it just goes to show, like while they have a good team without Ryan and without Owen, they I know it's the county lads that we usually focus on, but they are the really important driving forces behind the team. No, they they definitely are. Uh, I mean, like I suppose you have to caveat that, Willie, with the fact that like yeah, probably in a lot of places the Mayo League season was cut short, so right. you only had four league games, and that was without um, Ryan and Owen. And a lot of teams were using that as a kind of a, a testing ground for championship, let's say. But that's like so. So they are really important, but they but they do have a very solid kind of group behind them. But Ona Dunu, who has been before I get to Ryan, Ona has been outstanding. I mean, he's got you know little cameos from Mayo, you know, in recent years. Um, has been very good at times, and then kind of went off the radar. I, I think even even before this year, there was talk that he you know he, this year might be his chance to shine. It, it didn't really happen for him. But you know, kind of, he's 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 been there thereabouts for years, and has been really good at centre back, um, kind of just dictating kind kind of dictating the way Bell Mullet play, go about things and how we how we organise their defence. And Ryan, I mean, Ryan's been the best 
best player in Mayo this year. He, he arguably outside of Lee Keegan, he was Mayo's best player this year as well. But yeah. he is just like in in the games I've seen him against Parifi and against Westport, just inspirational leadership. It wasn't only his scores. I mean, he got one five in the semi final. I think five of them from for, were from freeze. And like while he didn't score from he didn't score a point from playoff Lee Keegan, he should have had Lee Keegan sent off because Lee Keegan got a black card in the first couple of minutes for fouling him. And the second half, he took him down and it was a black card or at least a yellow card all day. Um, and then he got the goal at the end. And that came not long after he did a massive turnover while Westport were on. Westport were on the charge and looked like, like they must, might get back into it. And like Ryan, one of his many turnovers that day, just kind of leads from the front as well. And he scored a goal with against Barifi in the quarterfinal that you'd go a long way to see better than that. He just, he lobbed Rob Henley after a long high ball came in off his left foot, off the wrong side. It was just absolutely outstanding. So he's been brilliant. He'll be front and centre, you know, for, for Knockmore's plans in terms of how they tie them up. But, I mean, Westport put the best man possible on him. And while he did well in them, Ryan still had a massive influence. So, you know, it, it's no matter what Knockmore do, I, I expect Ryan to have a big say come Sunday. And what, who do you expect to win it? Like, I presume the whole of Mayo are shouting for Bell Mullet here. Knockmore obviously won it last year. Yeah, and, and like, it's it's weird. It's not like Knockmore are a superpower or anything like that. They are they, they are one of the big kind of kingpins in, in Mayo outside of Casabar and Balaná. They did win it last year, but it's 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 nearly strange kind of tagging them with underdogs. Um, but the, the, the neutrals vote will go for Bell Mullet. I, to be honest, I would have said the exact same before the Brafie game. I would have said the exact same before West, Westport and that. I expect it to be tight, but I expect the other team to come out on top. Right. So I'm going to say the exact same against Knockmore. The only thing I'll say in Knockmore's favour is that Knockmore are that bit cuter, I would say, than both Brafie and Westport. They're probably that more, bit more tactically in tuned. And they have... <laughs> They have a fantastic, they have a fantastic bench. So, like Aidan Orm and not more the best set of forwards in Mayo, I would say in club football. Aidan Orm came on for ten minutes and for for Mayo in the All Ireland final. Peter Peter Nocton is on the Sligo panel. Neither of them scored from play against Gary Moore in the semi final, and they looked in trouble at half time. And then they brought two or three lads off the bench. They think they got one four off the bench. So, if Ben Mullet managed to tie down, um, you know. Uh, Knockmore's main men and there's every chance they will given the, the, what they've conceded to date there's just not more of so many options and that's not to speak of I haven't even mentioned Kevin Glockland and Connell Dempsey Ray Dempsey the manager's son who's, who's, who's really kind of emerging as a, as, a, as, a, as a really good player so I just think I really think that there will be nothing in it nothing in it and it wouldn't surprise me at all if Ben Mullet do end up kind of um, end, end up winning again and taking their third big, big scalp but I think I, if, I, if my neck was on the line I'd say not more by two points Thank you very much, Connor. Great stuff as usual. Cheers, Wally. So on to Fermanagh um, now. Derry Connolly play Enniskillen. And I was up in Letterkenny recently and I drove through Enniskillen and I saw der- a sign for Derry Connolly. So Derry Connolly is just 17 kilometres on out um, the road from Enniskillen. Enniskillen Gales. Jeez, when I was playing with Port Leash, kind of starting to play club in, in the late 90s and the noughties, Enniskillen were the big club um, in Fermanagh they won, I think they won six in a row lost a couple of Ulster finals as well so like I mean to hear they were down to intermediate um, you know last year they only came up last year from intermediate and in 2016 they were in a relegation semi-final to go down to, to Junior A which is just beyond belief they only won it by two points um, so like I mean it, it, it's, it's an incredible kind of turnaround for them as a club they won an Ulster minor club championship and in 2017 and a good few of those players have came through so they're probably in a county final a little bit earlier than they'd expectedly but at the same time local derby we're in it now let's bloody win it yeah absolutely I mean uh, you, you all of them stories the one intermediate last year and they're straight to the final as senior this year yeah um I read an interview there with their captain uh, Richard O'Callaghan he um so in the 2016 playoff he was heading to Australia yeah. but he like delayed his, uh, his trip by a week so he could play in the relegation playoff to make sure that they didn't go down to junior and um, the game or the match itself on the day was really rainy and really really bad weather and they were maybe talking about calling it off and he begged the referee to play it so uh, finally they did and they won by two points and, and then off he went but um, it was a good thing in the end you know kept them in their intermediate they got the rebuild there and now they're in senior but another interesting thing in the article he said um, he said that Derry Gonley actually 
relegated them from Division One before, and he said they celebrated it like it was a championship win. Oh. And I'll never forget that. You know? <laughs> so like you don't usually be that honest, or you don't usually hear them be that honest. So there's a bit of space to it as well. Like I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that'll come back to bite you. And actually, interestingly <laughs> enough, because we we're talking about Port Leash, Port Harrington last week, that did that prediction didn't turn out too well for me. But the the kind of mirror the mirror of a of a previous match, a very similar situation. But in 2004, that brilliant um, Ennis Gillen team was coming to, to an end and they played Derry Gonnelly in the final. Derry Gonnelly beat them in 2004. And now the situation has kind of flipped around. 2021, is Derry Gonnelly are looking like maybe, you know, you know well, they're the kingpins and they're, they've won a whole load in a row. Um, and Ennis Gillen and Gales are the young team coming along to kind of knock them off their perch. So definitely looking forward to that. That's in Brewster <coughs> Park. Um at three o'clock. Another big, huge county final is Glen Rovers Middleton. <coughs> this is interesting, Niall. Porky Cueve at uh, three o'clock. Like, I mean, I look at it, Glen Rovers. They've been in six county finals in the last decade and they've lost four of them because they won two in a row, you see. So you, mm. you kind of remember two in a row. They're going for three in a row. You think, geez, Glen Rovers are flying. They actually lost a good, you know, four, um, one, two, which I thought was under, which I thought was interesting. They also lost their first round match this year. And after losing the first round match, they had a big emergency meeting the next day. Yeah, no, it's um, it was it's a, it's a sign of the consistency that they have as a team that losing by ten points requires an emergency meeting. It was meeting to Douglas. The they lost by ten, eleven points to Douglas. Eleven wasn't it? points, yeah, and they're in for the emergency meeting the next morning. And uh, yeah, sure, like obviously a very consistent team to have been in six finals in the last ten years, but um, they had two good wins in fifteen and sixteen. Disappointing to lose the others, but they were unlucky last year. That should, that, that game against Black Rock went it went all the way to extra time, like so. They're definitely one of the best clubs in Cork, the traditional club in Cork, and like they've a lot of young players, like as as well as behind Patrick Horgan, like they've the two Downies, Robert, who was brilliant for Cork this year, like in fairness to him, full back, and his younger brother Owen was he was brilliant for the under twenties as well. So the two of them boys, I think they're out in the half back line for Glen Rovers, so they're sort of key men. And then there's um Christy Rings, gra- grandson is your man uh, Kennefick, full forward, and he I just remember him. He got a great goal in the county final last year. He kind of pulled it in, pulled on it in off the ground, and it's sort of an iconic thing to have to your name, Christy Ring's grandson, well, too, it, isn't it? Yeah, de- definitely. No pressure there now, actually, no. <laughs> none whatsoever. The other, the big story about Middleton is obviously Conor Lee Han. You can't talk about Middleton without talking about Conor Lee Han for the same reason as maybe Paul Mannion. You know why are, are you going? Are, are, well, it's not like it's his choice. Are you going back in? He was dropped. Like he didn't just leave himself. Conor Lee Han is a very interesting one in that he's <coughs> such a confidence player that when he doesn't have confidence, he looks like a very average player. And when he has confidence, he looks like one of the best forwards in Ireland. It's a very strange one, but he seems to have gone back to basics. He was asked after the before the final, it must have been a media day, about going back in with Cork. He says, I'm not looking past tonight. You know, you know he just brushed it off. Right. But in the form he's in for Middleton... Um, you know, you want him back in. And maybe that be, could be the best thing that ever happened to him. Go back. Yeah. You're on and off the Cork team. It's not working for you. We can't do. We can't seem to, to get you right. Go back, fly it with your club, play centre forward, which is probably your best position, and come back in the following year. Yeah. I'd be bringing, you'd have to bring him back in. Oh, like, he's an absolute world beater on his day, in fairness to him. Like, I remember, I'd say he was probably in his peak around 2016 and 17. And, like, just, like, nobody can stick with him when he gets a run on you. Yeah. Like, because he just takes off. And he's like, he's accurate. He's a great man to score and he could rack up four or five points in a game. But yeah, he was just on and off the, the last few years. And, and being on and off doesn't suit a confidence player. No, exactly. Like, and he's kind of just been inconsistent, kind of coming in as, as a sub. And yeah. it was all a bit bitty for him. But yeah, apparently he's going, going very well this year for, for Middleton. Like they had a really disappointing, <coughs> the la- they won in 2018, but they've been very disappointing the last two years. They were, they were beaten in the, knocked out in the group stage in 19. And then, Lost one at like the championship first round in 2020. So Ben O'Connor has definitely he's in as their coach and apparently he's been brilliant. Like he's kind of got them going again and um, he's he's been really invested in the club. But they've like they've a few young lads as well, like Sean O'Leary Hayes. You remember him? He played for oh, yeah. Cork and Tommy O'Connell. I've seen him under 20 a few times and he's real stylish. Lad who sort of burns it up. So um, it, he's should, in, it should be a good final. Like. He's in he's in the half back line because I was reading Middleton won back to back county minor championships two thousand and eighteen two thousand and nineteen right. and they've got a goalkeeper out of the, out of those two teams they've got two half backs they've got a midfielder and a half forward do you know what I mean that's like five very important players very important positions Lee like I mean it can't be underestimated you get a couple I know you can still get good lads from minor teams yeah, but in general 
it's minor teams that win is where you get the best fellas. Yeah, absolutely. And then the challenge is, is retaining them all as well, because, you know, it's like when you leave minor, um, it's never really the same again. You know, they're all the same age. You've went through so much together and then you join the senior and there's already like a, like a hierarchy there that you've got to try to break into. And you try to drag your friends along, but they're at that age where a lot of people drop off. So, you know, it, it says a lot for the club and the coaching and stuff, you know, if you can retain the players and bring them through. And like the stats show, you know, the more you get through, especially from the winning teams, um, and the more successful that, that senior team is likely to be. Yeah, yeah. Going to college is the big one, keeping players, yeah. isn't it? Because there are many players that go to Dublin and then they just never come back down and they just drift, they kind of drift away. That's the big one. Coppers is open they at 6 o'clock. <laughs> 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 they join St. Jude's. Coppers opens at 6 o'clock. Lads having a chance anymore. <laughs> no. I was actually, I was talking to Owen Finnerty, you know the Mount Bellew lad uh, during the week, Willie? Yeah. And he said they had 10 lads on their starting team that played in the minor final. It was 2014. Wow. And 10 of them on the starting team last Sunday. Wow. See, suppose Galway... City wouldn't be far to go. You know, there's plenty yeah. of work there for them. Maybe that's, that's you know, I, I think, like, if you look at, maybe then again, that doesn't work for Mayo either. They all seem to go to Dublin. I don't know, it depends how far yeah, away the big yeah. kind of place for college. Of course, Galway have a, has, a, has a university as well, which, maybe, as well. which maybe helps plenty of, plenty of nightclubs <laughs> open early. In awfully cool Derry Place, St. Rhinas, this is in uh, O'Connor Park at two o'clock. Uh, St. Rhinas are going for three in a row. Cool Derry, I thought, 2018, they won the county title. You know, that was that. What a great cool Derry team that was. That's kind of their swan song. They weren't in a final for the le- for the next two years. Here they are back. I think everyone thought that, Wooly. They 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 did a very disappointing campaign last year. I think they were well beaten, and people kind of thought, that, right, this is a spent force. Like this is the end of the road for Cool Derry. And like I was looking at their teams. They were. Should remember they were in the 2012 All Ireland Club final, and like that. That's nine years ago now, and there's the six five lads that started or six lads that started that day will be starting um on Sunday like so like they're it's not like they've had a massive sort of injection of young players it's just like Brian Carroll is still there he's he's still scoring all around him and Kevin Brady used to hurl for awfully I, he was a brilliant hurler back wing back back in the day and there's a David King um center back who's who's always been very good for them like so um to just the, the old guard are kind of still still there for cool and you'd have to admire them for it apparently there's a few young lads in too there's a malai playing wing back who's been very impressed for them this year as well so that's kind of maybe giving them the bit of the the boost that they needed yeah exactly there's some good provincial matches on as well lads so like i mean it's not just county finals and apologies we couldn't get through every one of the county finals um nace play tullamore again like i mean nace have a huge advantage here in that they won the first county title in a long time two weeks ago so they got to celebrate the the, the week Probably, you know, come back on the wen- on the Wednesday or Thursday, um, and Tullamore just beat just beat Road after a replay. You know, <laughs> it wasn't that long a wait for them, but they'll celebrate it out. Uh, like, I mean, I don't know that. Like, that's it's a very very clear advantage for Nace here. Um, Lee kind of ruins the celebrations a little bit of the county final because you either go listen as come on, don't go on the Tuesday now, and the Tuesday half the team might go on the Tuesday, and if you want to be serious about the following week, you can't really go to Tuesday. You know, you'd be rattled from the Monday. And I don't know, it's not fair from a fixtures point of view, um, you know, that, that, that I suppose the Offaly match went to a replay. So maybe the, with the Offaly not doing the extra time, which we talked about um, <laughs> last Thursday, maybe they have to suck it up. But it's a clear advantage. The point I'm making is a clear advantage to Nace here. Yeah, no, it is. Um, I was against the replay, so uh, this is this sort of backs up my point. Yeah, but um, no, Nice must be they. They have to see that as an advantage as well, and they'll take confidence from it too. Um, once they watch the match, they know that they're they're basically a week ahead in preparation. You know, so like you won your game, you celebrated. They done their their Monday club, Tuesday club, and they got all the pats in the back, shaking all the hands and stuff. But then, you know what? It's like you sort of sicken yourself with the drink. Um, you, you nearly want to get back to doing something productive again yeah. and then people start you know the conversation starts to turn so <coughs> well, what, ab- what about Leinster you know like what, how do you think you're going to do in Leinster and then you're at training again and you start talking about it uh, getting your head around it you don't even know who you're playing yet you know that they're going to be focused on their uh, county final still and like from a Tullamore point of view yeah. When, when do they stop celebrating? When's it okay? Till, are they allowed to rest on their laurels? Like psychologically it's training as well you know I mean you, you've just you give it this big effort, especially to build it all up again for the replay and to finally get over that line. You know, there should be that feeling of like relief, that feeling of, oh, we did it. But really it's like, oh no, there's there's more, you know, and, and that can be very draining. Yeah, no, it, def- it definitely is. Um, 
And that's they're two of the better teams in Leinster as well because they're an awfully champions traditionally and Port Leash and the Dublin Championships or Dublin Champions usually um, usually come out um, into the semi-finals of those. Um, Rat, Rat Philly are playing Nave Martin. I don't want to spend too much time on this. We, we just mentioned Rat Philly um, on Monday but it was in the gym uh, the other night. Um, it was in the steam room and I got talking to a lad. He told me Pat Ryan is the Rat Philly manager, a Port Leash man. Should have known this uh, but I didn't. Pat has a good record in in uh, in Leash. He managed Ballarone to a county title in 1992, coming on the end of Port Leash uh, dominance. Got Emo to a final in 2015. Um, they drew with Port Leash that day. Port Leash beat them in the replay, and he got Arles Killeen to a final as well. Wouldn't be huge, uh, you know. Wouldn't be huge clubs. He's getting the county finals now. He's won a county final, a county title with Ratvilly. Obviously, Brendan Murphy's uh, Brendan Murphy's club. Big achievement for him. Um, you know, it's nice to have Brendan Murphy. He's not committing to Carlo either, so having him in midfield the whole time. They stopped their rogue doing five in a row. So just thought I uh, Pat Ryan, very good Port Leash man, deserved deserved a mention and apologies for not <laughs> for not knowing that Rat Philly would have got a much bigger mention on the show on Monday. Um they play Nave Martin and that's obviously the team that McGuinness is helping out with. Um in Loud. They've won two in a row. So that's in the Leinster Club Championship. St. Eunan's play uh Glenn. Not De Glen, Glen. Um, that's in Letterkenny at one thirty. We're going to be talking to Connor Glass um, in part two about this one. This is the thing I want to give out about lads, and I know I know that th- this year is a very unique year, Lee, in that you know we're trying to get everything done, which is fair enough, and you'd accept it this year. But having these provincial competitions overlapping county finals is just wrong. It's total nonsense. And now when we get into the split season. When every county starts their club championships on August 1st, or the first weekend free in August, maybe not the all Ireland finalists, they might get an extra week. Every county, every single county should have a, an end date as well. And every provincial club championship should start the following week. And let's build up into these provincial championships. Like these have started now without even a bloody peep. Unions versus Letterkenny. Or Unions versus Glen Unions versus Glen in Letterkenny. Tullamore versus Nays. These are brilliant games. Like I way prefer the provincial club championships to the inter-county provincial championships. They're much better. Um, it's county versus county, just in a club context. They're really exciting games. And it's just started and nobody knows about it. Like there has to be more. Next year, when we were back in, we didn't get the championship restructure that we wanted, but at least we got the split season and the All-Ireland final will be the end of July. We have to have a system where the club championships all start at the same time, all end at the same time, and bang, a week or two later, we're into provincial championships as another stage on, you know, as Jim McGuinness says, the journey to the all or, the, the journey to the all Ireland final. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's a bit weird that they're overlapping. I understood that it's a unique year. Yeah, like you can almost forgive it this year just because uh, they're trying to cram things in and different counties have different agendas and stuff. But 100% it undermines the competition and it is the competition. Like it is so much better than the county championships. I mean, the finals are brilliant to be fair. But like you've got two teams who have just won the last like five, six, seven games in a row. You know, there's real momentum behind them. They've just won trophies. They've got like a bedrock of confidence. And, you know, they're on real highs. Like both teams really believe that they can go another step further and better yet both teams have actually peaked you know like we're the furthest away we could be from the rustiness of like a pre-season team you know these teams are sharp and they're fit and they're fast and they're lethal you know they're, they've gone the, they've got over that line you know of the county final you know, so they're, they're absolutely at the peak of their powers and then better yet it's even more entertaining because like Quite often, there's no history between the two teams because they wouldn't play each other a lot of the times. You know, like uh, like St. Unions and Glen at, at, at senior level, how many times would they have really faced for any meaning, anything meaningful? Um, so there's that era or sort of age of the unknown, you know, like how, how will they compete with each other? There's no history there. It's, it's just really <laughs> fascinating and entertaining. So for it to be underselled, um, it is a shame and, and there's nothing... And as you can really say on it, like yeah. it's 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 sad to see. I, I really want to see uh, a lot more weight thrown behind it. Yeah, I'm 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 always of the opinion that there should be a Sunday game. I, and I accept the county finals. Maybe you're not glamorous enough. You might get the odd one that's glamorous. But when you get to the provincial side, so that's the best in Leash taking on the best in Offaly, or the best in Dublin taking on, or you know the best in Derry playing the best in Donegal. You bring that inter-county rivalry into it, Niall, and a lot of counties row in behind the the county champions unless there's real bitterness involved. You've got the inter-county rivalry. Why can't we make a bigger package out of, you know, the provincial club stage? Like, I mean, for me, I've said it again, I, I just don't understand how this just goes along. 
and there might be a bit of talk about finals, but it's not promoted. It's not on tele. It's not a. Like, there's not a big deal made on. You know, later on that night, would you not watch a roundup of the provincial club championships with with some with some uh, some highlights? Oh, like I know, I know it's um, like it's maybe been a bit of a difficult year to get it all right this year. Yeah, with but the in other years too, that. though, it starts in dribs and drabs. Like it's crazy that that's happening, really, because like you're looking forward to the game. You're thinking, I'm just thinking of Road Tullamore or Road and Nace or Tullamore and Nace yeah. this weekend. She's making confused there. Tullamore and Nace is this weekend, and you're kind of the provincial club championships. It's probably it's just it's a game that you might never you know you might never see these teams play again you might you've never seen them play against each other before and as Lee said the bit of momentum that these teams have like you're kind of you're guaranteed to see both teams at the at the kind of the peak of their powers and it's just mad that they're coming up this weekend they're not going to be on telly like there's there's a Kerry semi-final on Saturday and in fairness the, the games are clashing on Sunday and they would show the Dublin final but like you probably you won't get to see now Nace and and Tullamore, you won't get to see Unions and and Glen like, and yeah. it's just, it's mad really, like because, like the, it, 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 you might you might see them on TG Cahar, but like those games are brilliant games and games with players like Connor Glass, Niall O'Donnell coming up against each other, like you'd be just buzzing to see them, and it's this point that you can't. Yeah, you definitely definitely another year. Hopefully they'll separate them. Moving on from all the matches, lads. Colin Murphy has been talking about Port Arlington system. Martin Murphy is obviously their manager. I was saying he is a Gracefield man and he's won four county titles. But I thought it was interesting because I'm banging on about this on the show all the time, uh, Lee. So Colin Murphy, you have to, I don't think Port Harrington have conceded a goal. They've conceded one goal in the last two championships. So they're absolutely brilliant at the back. Now, they've good individual defenders, but it's just interesting. Usually when you, you associate a team not conceding goals, you're thinking of a lot of players back and everything. And uh, Colin Murphy was explaining, he says, the backs give us nightmare, nightmares in training. They're so disciplined. And Martin Murphy has brought in a system as manager that were just very difficult to break down. We usually go with four up front, even when defending. But with the threat of Port Leash had on Saturday, we went with three. Remember being at the game, they played three up front all the time. Their, their centre forward, a lot of the time, Coffey tried to ma- maybe make it four, but he might have dropped back. But here's my thoughts always on Gaelic football. Every team should be leaving four forwards up. Because if you can't defend with your six backs and your half back line holding, and then you're dropping two midfielders into that half back line, now you have six against the ha- along the half back line, and now you have two wing forwards coming back. Right? Is that not enough lads to be defending if they're committed and they're in your face like Connor saying Bell Mullet love defending? Why don't you breed into them? Love it, lads. Get that ball back. Fight for it. And tackle with discipline and um, with determination. And are those eight players not enough to clog up a bloody field that when you win the ball back? You've two men on your half forward line, you've two men on your full forward line, and you've got a good kick pass there, and you don't have to waste all that energy breaking up and down the field that there's enough of a of a of a presence on the half forward line, bang, turn over on your half back line, outside of the boot, bang it down one of the wings. And it's up to the two lads on the half forward line. Play like you're on the full forward line. I want you sp- crisscrossing, I want you break into those wings and everyone and let you feed the full forward line, and there you go. And like it's not rocket science. It's science. Port haven't conceded. I think they've conceded one goal in two seasons. Colin Murphy's clearly saying there they love leaving four forwards up front. They 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 tweaked it against Port Leash because Port Leash had good forwards. How are teams not doing this? They, generally, teams and it's like this psychosis, this copycat. They're leaving two lads in a full forward line and the whole field of a gap, where there's no kick pass onto these lads when you win the ball back. Everything has to be run up the field. Why do I have to keep saying this on this show? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, cause that that seems to be the evolution back into like entertaining football again, isn't it? Um, I I don't know. Like, if if you're a really and you know yourself that you're the weaker team going into the match, maybe it's a league game, or you're you're just playing against a, a real juggernaut of a side, then you know you can sort of understand them going super defensive and being cautious with that. But when you've got like the best teams against the best. Yeah, still playing with that sort of caution and, and that sort of defensive, <laughs> overly defensive mindset. It, it doesn't really make sense. And like leaving three, four forwards up front uh, does make sense because they all talk about the work rate and getting up and back. But then the reason that like, the reason they stopped leaving people up front was because you were kicking it in and then it was getting swallowed up with all these mass defenses and then coming back out again. But if you've got enough people coming back, and it doesn't mean the running game stopped, but if you're running with it and you've already got options up there, the ball's just going to move quicker. Get it up there. If they need to hold on to it while you come to support um, and try to break that line, then that's okay as well. Or better yet, you catch them on the hop and then the forwards are on straight away. Um, it just creates more options. It's better to watch. It's better to play. And at the minute, 
it seems to be more effective. Yeah, I think it's a good balance between getting some bodies back to help out your backs and having enough up front. Because if you bring them all back, your attacking game plan suffers. You want to have a good defensive game plan and a good attacking game plan. And if you bring everybody back, you've only one attacking game plan, and that's a running game. If you if you leave some forwards up there, you have two attacking game plans, broadly speaking, which is a running game and an option to kick. Why would you not want two attacking game plans? And why would you decide that you only want one? It doesn't make any sense. Anyways, I'd, I'd be blue in the face talking. But it's refreshing to see Port Arlington playing like that, kicking the ball a lot. And blue Port Leash away playing that kind of football. So it's not like you can't be successful doing it. I loved what Connor was saying about Bell Mullet and how they, these boys, they love defending like the boys in the full back. Yeah. And he said they love it even more than Ono Donoghue. And it just reminded me of like the Italian soccer team in the Euro 2020. Like, and... You're thinking, why would you why would you drop more lads back to the fence? Sure, these lads wouldn't even want more lads back taking their jobs, the jobs <laughs> that they love, like, you know. Yeah. And in fairness, the way you're bigging it up there, the attacking football, you nearly had me fit to go out and play a game of football with that, with that <laughs> team talk, will it? You'd melt if you had to go out and kick a kick a football <laughs> round. Kevin O'Brien has stood down, lads, the Cora Finn manager, and like I mean, Jesus waiting to hear this fella's record. Like, I mean, we all know about Cora Finn. They haven't won in two years now, so he probably thought it's time enough um, to get out. He won 51 of his 56 championship games. They won 49 games in a row. Was that six or seven in a row in Galway? And they won, didn't you know, they won, didn't they win three in a row? They won three, in, they won yeah. three all earns in a row. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's, this is just beyond belief what that club did. Now, he obviously, Cora Finn have won four in that period. Uh, he was as a selector as with Stephen Rochford. Sometimes I don't give Kevin O'Brien as much credit maybe as he deserves because Stephen O'Brien's such a good manager and he transformed Cora Finn into a beautiful team to watch and to beat Slot Nail in the final was a 14 or 15 Kevin O'Brien was his selector and then Rot- Rochford went in with uh, went with Mayo and Kevin like in my head I'm thinking Asher he just continued on what Rochford did you know mm. that kind of way maybe I'm selling poor Kevin O'Brien shortly because you know uh, 49 games in a row 51 of 56 uh, championship matches the only teams to beat him Mount Bellew my lock have beaten him twice and the other team to do it was Dr. Crokes. I remember down the Gaelic grounds, it was on telly to beat them in an All-Ireland semi-final. And Cara Finn fairly got the revenge for that in the All-Ireland, the All-Ireland final um, the following year. So, you know, like, phenomenal. Probably never be repeated um, what Kevin O'Brien has done with them. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely remarkable, to be honest. I mean, and I know, like, they were in a very good place when he took them over, but sometimes... They, they say it's really hard to get to the mountaintop, but staying on the mountaintop is, is nearly twice the challenge. And they, they really did that. Like they dominated for so long. And the longevity of any team is, is a true sign of like how great they are. And you already said like Stephen Rochford got the Mayo job off the back of it. I mean, you got to wonder who's going to be looking for Kevin now. I'm not, I'm not saying he is looking yeah. for a job, but, but like what, what counties wouldn't be interested, like really big jobs in someone with a resume that impressive. Well, Longford have no manager now that you mention it and Down have no manager because Conor Laverty, uh, last week, Down had a management team of Conor Conor Laverty, (laughs) Marty Clark, Jim McGuinness, all sorts of a dream team. Laverty doesn't seem to want it at all. He was asked about it at some media day. I'm delighted I've been ratified to continue as Down under 20 manager recently and having Marty, Declan Morgan and Sean Boylan uh, back, not not that Sean Boylan, um, back is great. I think it it is. is I I think he was in with them last year. Didn't he do a few sessions with them, Lee? I, I definitely read it in a piece. Sean oh. Boylan was in and he was So it is that Sean Boylan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right, so they obviously won it. So that is a good backroom team. So he's committed to staying with Down. Um, or Down under 20s. So Down and Longford have no manager. As this isn't good enough, and it's interesting you say that, Lee, Kevin O'Brien free now, like wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be that far away to Longford. Um, you know, probably not that far to down either, would it, from Galway? It depends, uh, depends uh, whereabouts. But, like, I mean, to leave it this long, the club championship's over. <laughs> and every manager will tell you that they like to get in, they like to see the club championship, like get a feel of the place, you know, meet the players, all those kind of... Club championships are over now. So the only team they're going to see, the new manager is going to see, is the county champions. So if Down and Longford don't get an inside manager who know all the players, they're at a serious, serious disadvantage. So maybe Kevin O'Brien would be a serious disadvantage. Teams are allowed back training collectively on December the 15th. So, like, I mean, realistically, they're from their county board's perspective, it's, sh- it's shocking. And there's probably teams back training already. Like, and Well, they are, we long ago. Yeah, like, and, like, when you've county championships over, like, as, as you said, if you're trying to bring in a lad from the outside... Like, he's not going to know. Like, just say Kevin O'Brien only after stepping down last week. If Longford were to go to him, 
like it's no slight on Kevin O'Brien, but like he he couldn't know m- much about Longford football no. because he wouldn't have seen it. Like and uh, sure, it's it's it'd be fairly like uh, upsetting for the players too, not knowing not knowing who's going to be your manager for the next year, not having a clue really what the story <coughs> is with getting back to train and like you probably you wouldn't have gym programs. I'd say maybe they'd you'd have be working them, off last you'd, you'd years, be yeah. working off last years, but there's no kind of structure, no order to it. And yeah. uh, but the young lads coming up out of minor under twenty one that will get the call up this year, they're not. They're probably not doing any gym program, and they're the ones that need it. Yeah, geez, no, the the county board like the town Longford are falling behind, like and you'd. Like, you know, you want to have it, your house in order by this stage. like Big time. And, like, I mean, they're talking about the January pre-season competition starting back next year. Obviously, they were going to... They were recommended by the by the Football Review Committee or the Fixtures Task Force Committee, whichever bloody committee. I can't remember which one it, what it was. They recommended that they go. Obviously, to free up your starting provincials then in February and then the league-based championship, which a lot of people wanted. It made sense to get rid of them. But I suppose when you're just starting the league in... At the start of February, maybe they're talking about a knockout O'Byrne Cup, Dr. McKenna Cup type thing, you know, where you're you maybe two or three competitive games in January rather than two or three uh, challenge games. Uh, I'm less I'm totally against them if you're starting your provincials in February. But if you're starting the league as we know it now, which is, you know, pretty much get through the first few rounds and crank it up towards the championship. You know, I don't have as much of a problem with it uh, coming back in maybe as a knockout in that scenario, Lee. Yeah, no, it's because it is a bit of a slow burner in that sense with, with this current format. Yeah, uh, you sort of go through the gears at the start of the league, and then you find out where you are, and you sort of go from there. Like, are you going to avoid relegation? Can you actually win the thing, the or, or promotion maybe? But um, in terms of that preseason competition, like I was never, it's, it's a lot of football for them, but I was never mad against them. Like I, I sort of enjoyed them, like from a Tyrone perspective, trying to see, you know, them blood the new players in, see how they get on. Like I'd love to see like Lee Brennan, get a, a good bit more time in a drone jersey and see how he gets on, see if he can maybe uh, struggle stuff and, and, you know, cement the place in the team. And I'm sure a lot of fans are like that as well. But a knockout competition over the course of about three weeks, that seems, it just seems fairly doable, especially if they're back training now or, or officially back on December 15th, as you say, that's like two, three weeks away or something. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it does make sense. They might as well have something a little bit official and um, to play for. The the reason one of the reasons I didn't really like it is that January is pretty clogged with all Ireland club semi finals with Sigerson Cup and there was a lot of commitments for players in college and you know you say you say say you want a a run with the county and you're in UCD mm-hmm. and your county manager like this might be your only bloody chance to impress him in that competition <coughs> like you you know you have to tell the county manager here look sorry but I'm 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 committed to UCD and he goes all right so we'll see you next year you know I I was thinking there's too yeah. many players being pulled in different directions in January. I would have been just happy to free up January rather than having too much of an issue with a competitive game or two uh, now. I'd be the exact same because that's the that's the exact thing that's kind of undermining the Sigerson Cup and the Fitzgibbon Cups. Like, and we know like they're unbelievable competitions, but like in recent years, players have been they've been rushing off like to play. Na- the stories players playing national league games that Saturday, playing Fitzgibbon to Sunday. Yeah. Like, and, and wasn't it the Cara Finn players headed from All Ireland semi finals to, to play Sigerson Sigerson. final? Yeah, like and there's just too much going on at that time of the year. And I don't know. I'd say there's enough stages like where play, teams get county teams get the chance to play challenge matches against each other to look at new players. Like you, you don't really need this official competition, especially when it's taken away from competitions like the Sigerson Cup. So yesterday I was talking to Connor Glass who plays with Glenn and obviously Derry as well. He was at the at the launch of the AIB Club Championships, um, which we're really looking forward to. I started off by saying to him that it must be great to still be involved in the championship this late in the year. Um, it's kind of a benefit of playing in the Ulster. Like we set out the start of the year, focusing on purely the Derry Championship. And now, yeah, we find ourselves in Ulster and we'll do our, our best this weekend. That's the thing. You're, you're kind of used to Ulster club championships at minor levels. I was thinking usually teams, when they win the first ever county title, they're kind of happy with that, but probably not the same situation with Absolutely you Absolutely not. Um, we, we want to push on and um, go as far as we can, and um, that starts this weekend against the Unis that County. Yeah, exactly. So when did the celebrations finish? Uh, this morning. No, nah, I'm only joking. Um, <laughs> it finished for a, yeah, on the Wednesday uh, last week, so... We enjoyed our uh, Monday club and then a few boys went on it again Tuesday and then um, we obviously had this game this weekend so we had to focus in and get back to training. Right, so it was training Wednesday night? Training was on Thursday so took a Wednesday off and had a 
we chilled in. Yeah, Thursday night wasn't wasn't too uh, too nice as you can imagine. Yeah, but that's that's fair enough for Malachi though, because like I mean, some managers might go here. Look, you know, we're back on the Tuesday or the Wednesday, and you know, kind of take the 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 joy of winning it away from Absolutely. me. Absolutely, um, he's obviously a very experienced manager, and um, this is our first uh, senior county title. And look, the boys enjoyed it, but they didn't go over the top, and um, that's a sign of a good team and um, a focus group, and um, obviously focusing on Ulster this weekend. Yeah, exactly. So you're the first Glen team to ever win it. And the Gormley said after the game, um, it's the best day of his life. Of his life. Like, I mean, this is how much it meant to the yeah, club. Yeah, absolutely. And it's special come from him. Obviously, he, he was obviously a part yeah. of the 93 team who won the all Ireland. So it, yeah. that shows you how much it means to so many players other than the team. Um, you can obviously see it in the motion from the younger, even the younger group, the younger generation who probably haven't even played football before. Like, they were just engrossed in the whole occasion of it and uh, it was just great to see yeah exactly like was there a lot of pressure building on you because you'd had that underage success and then you were beaten in the final two years ago didn't make the final last year you know and now you're back in it again that's it a lot of pressure and Conor Carville the captain spoke about it after the game um, getting the bear off uh, getting the monkey off your back but it felt like an elephant at this stage um, <laughs> so that's yeah it's definitely just building up and Thankfully, we put in a good performance against Lachlan two weeks ago, and uh, it got it got us over the line. So, um, yeah, it was obviously good to get the first one. Yeah, like I mean, it was surprising how easily he won it in the end. You know, against Lachlan. Yeah, um, they're obviously a very experienced team, and they're a difficult team to play against. Uh, they play a brand of football that's quite hard to focus on your own game. They kind of drag you into their performance and. Um, thankfully we had built up a big enough lead that they had to come out and play a different style than what they're used to and um, yeah it favoured us in the end yeah no it definitely it definitely did you were, did you wear a face mask did you break your nose in the quarter final <laughs> I broke my nose in the last group stage um, yeah and brought out the, the Braun James face mask for the the championship <laughs> games just to give me a couple of extra XP um, in those close games yeah, as if you're not noticeable enough with the red hair and the size of you, you throw a face mask yeah, on you absolutely. as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, you got to stand <laughs> out. And look, it wasn't the most comfortable thing, but um, it served its purpose. Um, so how long more How long more do you have to wear it? Or what's the stuff? Like, you, you, got it, you got your nose reset, so it's just a, a matter of waiting until it kind of yeah, secures, look, it? Yeah, it would have been fine not to wear it, but um, just to be on the safe side. Um, like, it's six weeks ago then that I got a reset. So, look, it's all good now. Um but like I just, I was doing us, I was doing me favors from the quarterfinal, semifinal. So I was like, right, I may as well wear for the final as well. So just don't change much. I'm obviously very superstitious. <laughs> yeah, well, if you win the Ulster Club, we might see it on you for Derry next uh, year. I think so. I'll just get the trend rolling. Even might get a few younger boys getting the, the face masks. <laughs> Yeah, be intimidating. Look, come here. Look, I mean, you're back flying it now again, and like you had a great year, obviously with with Glenn and and with Derry as well. Uh, to be fair, with the promotion, and you know, performed really well against Donegal. Like, I mean, you were thrown in at the deep end at the end of last year. You're only off the plane, and you're landed in against Longford in the league. Did, game. Yeah, so uh, it's good. We got a, I got a preseason behind me, which is good up in Derry. And look, I spent a lot of time just focusing on my craft and doing probably stuff that I'd done when I was a teenager of just practicing. Um, like I had to regain all the skills and learn the, the style of the football Gaelic's obviously changed over the last five or six years since I left so developing those skills and um, learning the game again was something I enjoyed um, yeah going back to my, my underage level so, so what were you working on mostly like the obvious thing that would be jumping to my head you know is getting back used to the round ball and kicking yeah, uh, yeah just pure, purely technical skills and um, just repetition like um, it's a very different kicking style between AFL and Gaelic. Obviously, the balls are obviously a bit different. The flight of the ball and the different kicks are obviously a bit different. But actually, learning the game style and what teams are doing now and how to counteract the opposition. Like we obviously, I obviously watched a lot of Dublin over the last three or four years and what Brian Fenton done well and how they played and what works well in Gaelic. So not only physically and technically, but like just mentally of understanding the game and how I can impact it. Right. And like, t- I suppose tactically that is how, how you fit into it. Like I, I presume the game you played as a minor, 
was a lot different because usually minor is kind of carefree, you know, play more a traditional brand. So you probably had to learn what your what your role within the team That's is. It. As you said, minors, you can literally catch a kick out and then run the field and score a goal. <laughs> Whereas that's, <laughs> that's, that's changed now. Um, but I've found my role in the team where I, I have a good fitness base, so I'm able to get down and up the pitch um, and then try force a turnover. Obviously, I'm a bit of, bit of a bigger body um, in the middle, so I try get central and um, force a few turnovers, but then also obviously hit the scoreboard as well. So having that... Um, hybrid mentality of defending and attacking um, is something I focus on. Yeah, you, like you're very good at that. Like, I mean, that's very noticeable in your game. Like, even I was comparing you on the show to Aidan O'Shea. He, he's very good at dispossessing players, you know, and he's a big, he's a big fella. And I suppose it, you seem to, I don't know, you, like, I mean, for someone who's been away from the game for so long, you seem to be always where the ball is and kind of in the action. And then I suppose as the year went on, you're adding bursting forward two or three times in a game and trying to get yourself a couple of scores. That's it. I, I love the physical and the tackle side of the game. Um, that's probably engrossed in me through the AFL. Like I love the actual tackle and him hitting hard that side of the game. So any opportunity yeah. I can get to hit a body, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the opportunity. And then, as you said, obviously scoring points, points good as well. But I, I pride myself in the defensive actions more than offensive. Yeah, your first championship game then last year was against Donegal. Um, that was live on television. Like you were a bit, ru- you would have been a bit rusty for that one. I'd say you were still probably figuring. You weren't. I, how long were you home? A couple of the months. Less. Donegal Armagh game. The or the Armagh game. Yeah, rather, sorry. Uh, fairly rusty. Uh, like, uh, skills skills weren't too bad, but it was the understanding the game and like yeah. I wouldn't have played with any of those boys through the the preseason league campaign like I would have had two or three games whereas um the likes of our man those teams would have years behind them so um yeah I would have I was a bit of yeah you didn't really know where you're actually running and what your role was in the team yeah well that's the thing and like I mean I suppose when you're only when you're only back off the plane and you're the AFL star it's like everyone's expecting. She's we have Connor Glass yeah. back, <laughs> you yeah. know this kind of way, and and I'm sure, you, like I mean, you're still ha- having to figure all these things out, and all this pressure has been thrown on you. Absolutely. Um, look, Gaelic football and the players playing at county level are obviously they're the best and best in the the country. Like so, like you're not going as I spoke about before. You're not able to catch a kick it and run the pitch and just score a goal every time. Like there's that many good footballers out there these days, and you've got to focus on your strengths and where they fit into the team and I didn't really know at that stage whereas now I'm kind of seeing the benefit out of it because I'm actually able to focus in on my craft and focus in on my role in the team and it's shining three whereas I'm not really focusing on right I need to score two five today or I need to catch every kick out yeah yeah exactly and do you chat to Rory about that is it like is Rory a help or is it a matter of you going like I have to say I relate to that I put when I was playing for leash I was moved from wing back to wing forward and nobody really advised me what to do. And I looked at different wing forwards, how they played, and went, well, that's not for me. That's, you know, there's too much work involved in that. I'm not good at breaks. What am I good at? And it was just a matter of going, what what can I take from their game that I would be good at? Absolutely. And Rory's helped me big time in that. Um, he's put a lot of time into not only, like, it's it's open and, open and honest conversations between me and Rory. He kind of tells me, um, what I can focus on, but he does it in a, a nice way, if that makes sense, uh, which is good. Like, I obviously need to see what I can improve on, and he tells me what I'm, that I'm good at. So having those open and honest conversations of where you can improve and um, what you can work on is is key in any sport and key in any way of life, really. Um, so, yeah, it's, as you said, focusing on your role in the team and looking not only – at yourself, but looking at other players and what they do well and trying to implement that into your own game um, will only benefit it. Yeah. So what Gallagher said to you, watch Fenton this weekend and watch how many times he bursts forward and how he, you know, managed to, to not do it every time, but to do it maybe two or three times. 100%. And, and his just, his patterns of the way he runs around the pitch and he's, he's similar to like he'll be able to get back the pitch and then he has that fitness base of being able to go into attack and then join him in the attack. So, um, that was someone I watched when I first came home because he is obviously the star of the competition and still is, um, and yeah. at midfield especially. 
That's interesting. Have you met? You haven't met? You haven't come across him yet now after after watching him so often. I haven't. No, I haven't met him yet. Um, but I know every every step he takes now. <laughs> watch him Jeez, uh, you're really building up this Derry versus Dublin midfield <laughs> battle now. I uh, hopefully, or hopefully, we're at that stage and we get the opportunity to play against uh, one of the best. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Come here, Liz, you're, you're settled back in at home now because, again, like I keep saying, you were thrown in, the, in at the deep end against Longford, then a championship match against Armagh. And at the whole time, were you, you know, psychologically having to deal with being home now and the AFL thing over? And did it take you a long time in your own mind to get over that um, being it over? It definitely did. And especially the first couple of months where I came back here and I was coming into not great weather. <laughs> And it was in the middle of yeah. COVID as well. So we went back into lockdown when I first arrived. Um, so like it was literally, it was gloomy days. And like most of the times I'd literally go out and train. Like obviously we weren't training at that stage, but like go out and run by myself and go and play Xbox or something. I like got there. Like I was questioning, like, is this the right choice? But um, looking back on it now, absolutely it's the right choice after the success we've had this year. Um yeah, and moving back in with the parents was a bit weird because obviously I haven't lived with them in five or six years. Um, yeah. But I've actually I've, I've moved out into my own place now and um, I'm enjoying that that freedom as well. So living a big boy lifestyle now. <laughs> very, very good. You're, you're in Jordanstown I'm now, are you? I'm a second year student, yeah, at Jordanstown. Right, very good. So was that something that you had set up before you came back or how long was it in your mind you were going to be coming Yeah, back? that was something I had put in place before I had moved back. Um, the, actually the week of the week starting of university, like I was in Sydney, I was out, I was in Sydney, like, and I was online taking a few of the classes because it was obviously online at that stage. But, um, yeah, it was only one or two weeks I had to do online when I was in Australia, uh, for uni back here. And then once I came back, then it was just, yeah, back into the, the actual reality of, yeah, the uni life. Right, straight into it. Come here, where did you play over in Australia? Because I know a lot of the Irish fellas, they usually play wing back and they tag because it's the, the easiest position to to just get used to it. Like, I mean, you don't strike me as the wing back tagger, you know, the size yeah. of you. But like, where, where did Look, you play? I, I started off at half back. Um, I guess right. that was all Irish people kind of start there because it's, it's quite easy to learn the game from half back. Um, yeah. But I moved. I literally played everywhere on the field. <laughs> I have like I was known as like the hybrid, whereas I could play on a small defender or a key defender. Um, but I spent most of my time in the midfield, inside mid or on the wing, um, because I had that fitness base of being able to get up the pitch. Similar to Gaelic football is now like I'm able to help the defenders defend, but then also connect with the forwards. So that was my role on the team. Uh, playing on the wing. Right, okay. So yeah, again, that was hard too because I know Zach too. He um, he's that hybrid player now, but he turned into that hybrid player after you know focusing on one position you know for for a long time. I guess that was it's one of the things I struggle with because whereas if you focus on one position, you learn that craft. Whereas yeah, you're trying to take in all this information of different positions. They just so much technical things that can go into one position, especially in the midfield. Um, that you have to learn and you can get quite overwhelmed with it so um, that was one of the things I struggled with at the beginning was learning each position and what's involved for each position especially not coming from the sport which can help well exactly that's it like I mean it's trying to find your like we're talking about Gaelic football at least your midfielder you can focus on that it's a new game new country and you're having to learn a whole lot of different positions yeah and I, I fully embraced it and I, I, I loved it like I loved the ability to be of playing midfield and then if the coach called you to go back to the back line or go up to the forwards, like I love that versatility. Um, um, right. But as I said before, like at the beginning, I kind of struggled with it because it was that there was so much information to take in. But in hindsight, would you take? Would you think maybe saying to the manager, "Geez, look, just focusing on one might be, you know, might be better," or you were happy? You're happy even now to have um, done that. I would have. At the start of the career, I probably would have, yeah, focused on one position um, and tried to cement my spot in that position and solely focus on that position. And then if the career went as I wanted it did, I uh, wanted it to, um, have that flexibility of playing multiple positions. But at that stage, I didn't really, yeah, I didn't really know my role in the team. Yeah, exactly. So come here, you have unions this weekend. Um, 
Were you watching them in the county final? I wasn't watching it live. Um, I was out celebrating <laughs> after my game. Like um, but I watched the game back and they obviously, they're obviously a very well-drilled team and just a typical Donegal team of um, purely um, counter, counter-attack counter football and they obviously have big scoring threats in the O'Donnells. So, yeah, it'll be a tough challenge this weekend. Yeah, you don't have far to go for it. It's in Letterkenny, yeah, right? They don't have far to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's up in Letterkenny at their their home ground. So um, yeah, just over the border, which is which is good. It's a really exciting Ulster Championship. To be fair, this year I think you've gone in as favourites. Which I'm, to be honest, from seeing some of your quotes, Connor, Connor, you you're happy to say we we'd like to target an All Ireland with Derry. You know, you're happy to embrace. You know, being very optimistic and confident about Glenn's chances in Ulster. I'm sure. Yep, you've got to be confident, confident in anything you're doing. Really, if you go and half hearted, like you're not going to succeed. Like so, you've got to fully back yourself and back your teammates. To, uh, yeah, to do the job. Um, but we've we're not looking too far ahead. We're fo- solely focused on this weekend, and we'll take it each weekend as it comes. Uh, but we have a yeah, we have a yeah, tougher no. route. No, no, you definitely do have a tough route. But that that's one thing. Just before we finish up, is the kind of the 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 confidence maybe players have in the AFL say, yeah, we want to win that. We think we're good enough to win it. There's a very conservative attitude in the GEA where if you're if you show a little bit of confidence or you know this is what we want to do, they're like, oh Jesus, you know, it's kind of it's frowned upon. You have to be humble yeah. and you have to say, oh, God. you know, like it's not really like that in the AFL or in other sports. They're happy to say, here, hang on a second. You know, with the talent we have, we should be, you know, doing whatever. That's 100% true. And I guess a lot of people aren't confident and they wouldn't speak out about it in case they don't succeed and they're probably a fail- failure. Um, but like we've, as I mentioned before, like you've got to be confident in everything you do. And if you don't succeed, then you don't succeed, but you move on, you've, you put your best foot forward, um, but yeah, there's yeah, there's a different sort of culture, and the Australians are quite outspoken. Um, whereas I guess some of the Irish players might be a bit conservative um, and expressing their own opinions. Yeah, yeah, we're the complete opposite. Well, listen, more of it, more of it from you, anyways. Um, it'll it'll be good to good to see. Come here, listen, Connor. Thanks very much for giving us your time, and best of luck against Unions at the Cheers, weekend. Lord. Thank you. Yeah, great stuff from Connor there. Right, we'll leave it there for today. We'll be back on Monday as usual. We'll, re- we'll review all those county finals and a bit on the provincials as well. So we'll talk to you all then. Good luck. <laughs>